Mace, let's start with on a day that there was not a lot of Denver Broncos drama. There actually was drama, and we have kicker drama. We have kicker drama, Mace. Reset for us this bizarro three, four hours with kicker Will Lutz. Started with Lutz and his representation agreeing on a three-year deal with the Jacksonville Jaguars where, coincidentally enough, he would have again replaced Brandon McManus just as he did here in Denver. And then a few hours later, nope, hold the phone. And I'm surprised this doesn't happen, by the way, more because you can't these days because you can't put pen to paper until Wednesday. He's coming back to Denver on a two-year deal. Mm, Okay. So what happened? I mean, what do we think in those three hours changed Will Lutz's mind from, yeah, he's definitely going to Jacksonville to, nope, change of heart. He's going to be the Denver Broncos kicker the next couple seasons. Probably the Broncos giving a little more than they had planned to. A little bit of arm twisting. You wonder if there was a Sean Payton conversation involved. One of the things about Will Lutz is that He's a security blanket for Sean Payton. Payton went through 10 kickers in his first 10 seasons in New Orleans before they brought in Will Lutz in 2016. And with the exception of the year when Lutz was injured in 2020, Lutz has been Payton's guy. Sean hasn't had to worry about that. And Lutz has been able to handle the highs and lows of playing in a very demanding environment with a very demanding head coach. So do you think it was as simple as... They think they're going to get Lutz back. They find out he's going to go to Jacksonville. And Sean just picks up the phone and says, bro, you got cut by the Saints last year. I had two kickers here and just gave you a job. Mm -hmm. I gave you jobs in New Orleans. I've done you solids over the years. Do me a solid and come back to Denver. Could it be that simple? A little bit of that, I think, also, it's you know the environment, right? Will Lutz knows what it's like to kick for Sean Payton. And Sean Payton has a lot of comfort in Will Lutz. Head coaches, unless they're of a special teams background, don't really like to worry about the kicking game. No, they just want the ball going through the uprights. Right. You're only concerned about when something is, goes wrong, when there's a bad snap. Like, you know, why did we bleep up the snap? Right. That's, for most head coaches, that's the extent of it. You have special teams coaches and, spe- and specialists to handle that. And kicking is such a different discipline than almost anything else in the game of football. It's not something that, again, it's not something the head coach really wants to concern oneself with. So there's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of logic and a lot of reasons why it'd be worth it to stick together. And here's the other thing. Every indication I had gotten prior to today was that the Broncos were going to bring back Will Lutz. It was honestly a shock when word came down that, oh, he's agreed to, some, he's agreed to a contract with Jacksonville. Every indication I'd gotten was that Will Lutz was going to be back as a Denver Bronco. That, you know, they're they, they're going to lose some players. We'll get into them as the course of the show goes on. But Lutz was somebody they thought they could bring back pretty comfortably. Yeah, I just think the whole situation was weird. And, and I think, frankly, maybe they used Jacksonville as leverage, and that got leaked mm-hmm. as it's done. He's going to Jacksonville, mm-hmm. and then Lutz's camp probably said, "Whoa, slow down here." We're talking to Jacksonville. That doesn't mean we're going to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. You said it to me five minutes ago. Maybe the Broncos sweeten the pot a little bit, sweeten the offer, two-year deal, whatever. Something about the Jaguars was used as leverage for the Broncos. And ultimately, like you said, it would have been a shocker if Will Lutz had left Sean Payton after how many opportunities Sean Payton has given him in this league. Yeah, given the opportunity in New Orleans, given the opportunity uh, in Denver after Lutz lost the competition with Blake Groupie. The other thing, of course— even though the compensation in trade was fairly minimal, you did give up a draft pick for Will Lutz. Mm, I had forgotten about that, yeah. So if he'd walked out the door after one year, would have hurt a little bit, right? Then it'd be like, okay, you trade a draft pick for a kicker who's not around. At least now you have that feeling of, all right, that trade worked out. You got the best season in terms of field goal success rate for any Broncos kicker since Connor Barth back in 2014. Wow, go back. Yeah, and you got somebody who is comfortable, again, with a a high-pressure, high-stress environment because playing for Sean Payton, playing in that environment, it's not for everybody. It's not. It's not. So that was sort of the the drama of the day with the Broncos. And, you know, that's sort of fitting, I guess, Mace, that 
here on the first day of free agency. It's the kicker that is uh, the story, if you will, because as George Payton tried to warn us at the combine, the Broncos weren't going to do much, not in on the first wave. That being said, they do give out significant money to safety Brandon Jones of the Miami Dolphins, now of the Denver Broncos, a bit of a Justin Simmons replacement. He'll team up with P.J. Locke, who got re-signed over the weekend. Figure Caden Stearns to be in the mix as well. Tell us what you know about Brandon Jones, and did it surprise you that they did make a little bit, not a massive splash, but a little bit of a splash in day one of free agency, and, and safety was their position of choice after cutting Justin Simmons last week? Mildly, but it's also interesting to look at the Broncos' safety composition because Delarian turner Yell, who did struggle last year when he filled in, he's coming off a torn ACL, and Caden Stearns is coming off a knee injury that cost him the last 16 games of the season, and Stearns unfortunately has a long injury history going back to when he was at Texas. So you were looking at a scenario where you had P.J. Locke and then injury concern on Turner Yale, injury concern on Stearns, and then J.L. Skinner, who played two snaps on defense, who played in two games, and I believe one snap on defense last year. Yeah. So you needed somebody in there. Brandon Jones is interesting because he's been a starter for Miami but after he tore his ACL in 2022, came back, he was a rotational player for much of this past season before getting back in the lineup. And he's really interesting because this is a guy at 190 pounds. He plays with more thump than his size. He's somebody who can be really effective on safety blitzes as well. And so he becomes an interesting Swiss Army knife type of safety and it kind of shows you that the Broncos are looking in a different direction for what they want at the safety position. And real also, real quick also, they like J.L. Skinner, who, of course, like I said, played one snap last year. But you still don't know where he's going to go. Mm. But if Skinner, who a lot of people had pegged as a second rounder last year before he had an injury and slipped in the draft and was available in round six, if Skinner develops and ends up outplaying some of these guys and earning more playing time. The Brandon Joe's contract, the PJ Lock contract, you're not handcuffed to them, right? It's, yeah, it's a three year twenty million dollar deal. Uh you're effectively gonna... two years twelve million, like in terms of the, the general accounting relative to the dead money. Okay. So yeah. you're not I mean you were supposed to pay Justin Silverman's fourteen and a half million. So you've cut that number in half for yeah. next year. And the other thing, like if you look at actually if you took the total in terms of average per year contract value of Stearns, Skinner, Locke, and Jones, you wouldn't even come to the money that you saved by cutting Justin Simmons. Effectively, if you take Jones and Locke alone, they come in in terms of average annual value a little over $4 million cheaper than what you saved in terms of cutting Justin Simmons. This is, this is money-balling it. You are trying to create something in the aggregate, and you're trying to get savings wherever you can to try to build a team over the next two years with that $85 million hole in the roster. Yes, the Russell, Mil Russell Wilson created cap issue that the Broncos are in, but let's be fair, Justin Simmons, 30 career interceptions, Brandon Jones has three, so... That is the downgrade you are getting here is 27 fewer interceptions, and you're getting a player in Brandon Jones, who I understand finished 2023 strong. Mm -hmm. But like we've pointed out, he's a rotational guy. He only started six of the 16 games for the Dolphins last year. So there's a reason Brandon Jones was available for, like you said, essentially two years, 12 million, 320 is the full term. We'll see if he plays the full term. Yeah, and the other thing also is, I mean, he was a starter before the injury. So you're basically saying, all right, he's a year beyond the ACL Let's see where he is. Let's see if he can produce. All right, so Brandon Jones is in. Will Lutz is back. They lose Jerry Judy over the weekend. They lose Russell Wilson to the Steelers last night. They cut Justin Simmons last week. And today, Mace, we get a fourth sort of household big name out the door with center Lloyd Cushenberry the third going to the Titans. He gets four years, $50 million. He'll be the third highest paid center in the NFL. Not a surprise here. I thought you nailed it. I talked about this a lot on the show the last couple of weeks. When you wrote, when they didn't franchise anyone, that meant Lloyd Cushenberry was gone mm -hmm. because he was the realistic only franchise tag candidate. Hey, good for Lloyd to get paid, but also 
he wasn't in their plans with what they have on their roster and the number he eventually got today from Tennessee. And here's the thing. If they had tagged Cushenberry, it would have meant that they're getting close to re-signing him because they would not have had him play on that tag. That it was tag, too much money, yeah. Yeah, that tag was $19 million a year. He's going to play on a contract with Tennessee that's $12.5 million a year, which is substantial. I mean, it's it's a for a center, that's really high. Um I believe I saw something in terms of the cash value he's going to receive over the next two years. It's the most for any center in the history of the NFL. But once they didn't tag him, that was the sign that they were they were far enough apart. And, you know, Cushenberry ended up getting, I think, maybe even got a little more than he would have, he and his representation would have expected on the market. I think they were expecting anywhere from 10 to 12, 12 and a half million a year. That's pretty nice payday for Cush coming off of the best season of his career. All right, so we know they've got some options. Fill us in on who could be the starting center now that Cushenberry is officially gone. And do you think that this offensive line can sort of just plug and play with all these other parts that, you know, Mike McGlinchey, Ben Powers, Quinn Miners, Garrett Bowles, in a perfect world, it should just be replacing one guy, and that'll be Lloyd Cushenberry. Well, it'll be fascinating to see what happens on Bowles, whether they keep him at the current cap figure or they uh, – extend him to get some relief and get that $20 million cap figure for this year down. But I think he's going to be on the team, right? I, I think if ex- we had had this conversation last week, we would have said, eh, we don't know. But I think because he made it to today, yeah. to free agency, Garrett Bowles is going to be on the Broncos next year. Well, no, because this key day is still Wednesday for players that are under contract for this year. Garrett Bowles is under contract for this year. Okay. So is DJ Jones. The key day is still going into Wednesday because you're talking about do you extend them. That's that's in regards to kind of the accounting of it. So you would say he's not out of the woods, but I would be surprised if Garrett Bowles is not on this team for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is if you do go for a young quarterback, you've already lost your center. You don't want to lose your left tackle, who had a pretty good season last year. I mean— if you're gonna if you're gonna give a young quarterback a fighting chance when that guy gets out there, you don't do it by completely destroying a unit that was eighth in the league in pass block win rate last year. So you're telling me Bolsey isn't out of the woods, but you agree with me. He'll probably be on the team next year. So if you bring back four of the five mm-hmm. offensive linemen, do you like Wattenberg? Do you like Forsyth? the two draft picks the last two years who could potentially replace Cushenberry. I don't think they're going to go free agent shopping. I think they're going to try to replace internally. It's between the two of them. I think in terms of a veteran, you'd look on the market if you get to the summer and you don't like where Forsyth and Wattenberg are going. There's always someone you can get a year out of who's available as you get into June, July, August. There, remember when the Broncos got Dan Copen mm-hmm. off the scrap heap, and they got a good year out of him. So I think what you do now is you let Forsyth and Wattenberg play it out. Wattenberg's actually had some snaps in the regular season. Forsyth didn't even get a jersey. He was inactive for all 17 games last year. But I would still give a slight edge to Forsyth being somebody that this coaching staff drafted specifically for what they're doing blocking scheme-wise. And it wouldn't be without precedent even for the Broncos because they started Matt Paradis week one of 2015. He spent the previous year on the practice squad. He didn't play a regular season snap either. Yeah, And that worked out fine. Alex Forsyth, by everything I've gathered, really smart player. Uh, Some thought he would go well before he actually went in the draft last year. And I'll give you a little interesting thing here is let's say the Broncos go in the Bo Nix direction quarterback in the draft. Yep. Forsyth and Bo Nix know each other pretty well from their time together in Oregon. Yeah, they snapped to him before up there with the Ducks, that's for sure. So let's look big picture. You and I haven't chatted in a little while, and heck, this show hasn't been on the air since Friday night, and a lot has happened since the show was Mm -hmm. on the air. Jerry Judy getting traded to Cleveland, Russell Wilson signing with the Steelers, Lutz is back, Cushenberry's gone, we found out Simmons would be out late last week. Kind of a slow start to free agency, as George Payton warned us up at the Combine. Big picture. You're not shopping at Nordstrom this year, you're shopping at Target. You are. Shout out Target. I love Target. Me too. 
<laughs> what is your biggest takeaway from what we've learned about the Broncos in the last 72, 96 hours? And I know you wrote a column late last week, too, at denversports.com that they are finally rebuilding, as is long overdue. They're rebuilding, but is the team appreciably worse than it was at this time last week? No, but that's a major indictment on Russell Wilson and Jerry Judy Mm -hmm. more than anything else, that your QB1 and your supposed wide receiver one never lived up to expectations. Arguably the biggest loss is Justin Simmons. Has to be. Yes. I I think if you had to rank the four, Mace, it's Simmons one, it's Cushenberry two, and then flip a coin between Russ and Judy three and four. Am I wrong? I don't think you're wrong. I wonder what your friend James Merrillat, our friend James Merrillat, would think of that. Uh, he would say yeah. Russ is one, uh-huh. Simmons is two, Cushenberry's three, and Judy's four, I think, although he wasn't real thrilled with the Jerry Judy trade either. So yes. would love to hear James's thoughts. That's, He'll uh, be on with me tomorrow night, and I'll ask him. I will, I will be listening, and I'll, I'll check that out. But, yeah, the team, uh, talent-wise, until you figure out who the quarterback is, I think you'd say probably it's, it's worse at quarterback with Jarrett Stidham for Russell Wilson in the moment. We're not really going to get the full answer on that until we get to the draft, probably, right? It's going to be, you know, bits and pieces figuring it out. The question, so I would also ask you this. Are you surprised that we're sitting here today at 6, 17 p.m. and right now the quarterbacks on the roster are still Jarrett Stidham and Ben Nucci and no one else? No, I think that's a good thing, Mace. I, I think no news is good news on the QB front, like when Gardner Minshew went to Vegas today, Gardner Minshew's a fun story, and he wears Mm -hmm. the jorts, and he's got the RV, and he's this quirky guy. I was glad. I don't think they need to bring in another body to compete with Jarrett Stidham and then clog it, log jam it, for a rookie to eventually get the starting job. Mace, I think no news is good news if the Broncos don't sign a quarterback this week. I think one Jarrett Stidham's enough, one bridge backup guy's enough, and then no QB this week would be the clear sign yet they're going QB in round one. I am actually holding my breath that my favorite NFL insider doesn't drop that Sam Darnold or Ryan Tannehill or Zach Wilson or Jacoby Brissett is signing with the Broncos. I think that'd be a mistake. There is no path to a Lombardi trophy in the next five years with any of those four guys. No, but there's a path to properly developing a rookie quarterback that you'd bring in if you have a sturdier bridge than Jarrett Stidham appears to be. Well, then why is Jarrett Stidham still on the team? If you want to sign Sam Darnold, that's cool, but then cut Jarrett Stidham. I don't need another guy in that room. Ben DiNucci can be that third emergency QB guy. So I actually think we're agreeing a little bit here that, hey, if you want someone to, to come bridge it for JJ, that's cool, but they don't need Stidham and another bridge and a rookie too many bodies for my liking. Unless you're trying to maximize what you are this year. And I, I I mean, even though I don't think it'll be a great season in the win-loss ledger, I don't think they're throwing up the white flag on it. And that's why you'd bring in another quarterback, even if you draft a quarterback. That's why I think you'd bring in someone else. And the other thing is also, let's say, I'll throw a name out there, Sam Howell, right? If you trade it for Sam Howell, there's still enough unexplored with Sam Howell to maybe he can be the guy. It's an uh, is the likelihood in his favor? No, but it's another it's another arrow. But Mace, if they get Sam Howell and that means they don't go QB in round one, I think Broncos country will be di- disappointed. Yes, they will. But I don't think you're doing this based on what the fans want. Well, they should start to consider that because you're a little out of touch after seven straight losing I, seasons hey, and eight seasons I without get, the playoffs to say, oh, the fans don't matter. The fans will always be there. That I, is the epitome of arrogance. I get that. I, get, I completely get that. But I'm saying that that's not going to be something that weighs heavily into the decision making of how is it going to be perceived if for training camp this summer the quarterbacks are Jarrett Stidham, Sam Darnold, and even like a, a like a, a mid round rookie like a Michael Pratt, right? Well, what's the incentive for Sam Darnold to sign here if he could end up as number three on the depth chart? I mean, Sam Darnold's trying to start in this league again because he believes that he could, he could walk in and be better than Jarrett Stidham and somebody else. I mean, he went to San Francisco in part last year in part because nobody knew if Brock Purdy was going to be ready coming off the elbow injury. Turned out Brock Purdy was ready at a very good season. 
So Sam Darnold was redundant. So it sounds like to me plans. that this this is our biggest disagreement of the night so far. Yeah. That you want them to sign a quarterback this week, and I really, really do not. I would like to see a quarterback in there that ensures that they don't have to put a young quarterback in there too soon. Because let's say let's say they decide to trade up. Let's say it's trade up for Drake May or J.J. McCarthy. Sure. Right? I don't think playing them extensively this year is going to do them any favors. C.J. Stroud would beg to disagree. They well, That seemed C. to work out. C.J. Stroud was in a different environment, different team, different type of quarterback, and especially running Sean Payton's offense. I think the best thing for a Mayor McCarthy, who are considerably more raw, I think, than C.J. Stroud was coming in, is that they sit and watch for potentially the entire first oh, season. Oh, Maze. We haven't I'm made not, the playoffs in I eight am, years. Throw these dudes into the fire because if you don't, if they, then you're saying you're going to suck in 24. Oh, and we're going to suck in 25 because that's going to be their rookie year. And maybe in 26 we'll have a breakout. And if you throw them into the fire without a fire suit, they get burned. And what do you have? You have you, you've wasted a quarterback prospect. I don't know if wasted. I mean, Jordan Love got thrown into the fire once he sat, and he was terrible the first half of the year, and he was great the second half of the year. That's the thing. Sometimes it takes time, especially when you're talking about, uh, you know, someone like Drake May coming from a relatively rudimentary offense at North Carolina. He's going to pro he's going to have to learn how to kind of process through things in a more complex offense. J.J. McCarthy comes from an offense on a higher level. The th some of the things that he's missing, for example, are you know, kind of being able to carry the offense in a way they didn't always have to at Michigan. Either one of those quarterbacks, I think you're, and they're also on the young side as well compared to Jaden Daniels, compared to Caleb Williams. Um, How are they going to learn Sean Payton's offense by not playing on Sundays? How are they going to learn Sean Payton's offense by holding a clipboard? You're, you got to get them out there. You're building the foundation every day in practice, in mental reps, Max in Crosby's film not study. coming after you in practice. You're building, you're building every day to where when you throw them out there, they're not blinded, right? They're, they're, they're not dizzy from what's being tossed at them. And the sturdier your, your, your bridge, the better you are positioned to say, okay, if this quarterback isn't ready, we don't have to put him out there. It's, look, and if, look, if the young quarterback is ready, like C.J. Stroud was, Throw them in, and I don't think they would hesitate to do that. But you want to make sure you're covered to where you don't have to do it before they're ready. All right. Well, hey, guys, YouTube is where it's at these days. We've got a ton of content on our Denver Sports YouTube featuring Andrew Mason, Cecil Lammy, Rachel V. Hill, and the whole crew. Let's go ahead and get our YouTube to a new level. If you could like, comment, share, subscribe, that's the most important. We'd appreciate it.